And I've titled today's message, The Position of Christ. The Positions of Christ. And it's found here in John chapter 19. It's verses uh, 16 through 30. So let's, let's read these verses and then we'll jump into them. This is actually the crucifixion scene from John's account. So starting there in verse 16, we read these words. So he then handed him over to them to be crucified. They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the to the place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two other men, one on either side, and Jesus in between. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. I love that part. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts a part to every soldier, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my other garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were, were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour the disciple took her into his own household. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Let's go to the Father for a moment in prayer. Oh, Lord. Every thing in all of human history. Before this event, everything before that was literally pointing to this particular moment and this particular weekend that we call Easter. After Resurrection Sunday, everything from that moment to this has pointed back with the recognition of what your son did for us. But at the exact same time, just as all of that history before Easter was pointing to your son's arrival, we now live in a time period where we look back at the cross and are grateful for the work that was done, but we also look forward towards the hope of your son's second coming, knowing that he has promised to bring his bride home with him. And that if we on this side of eternity would enter into a love relationship with you, that we can then be counted as part of the body of Christ, the bride, the church. So Father, we are asking this morning that as we look at the moment in human history when your wrath was literally poured out on your son, when the, the judgment of sin was, was, was the punishment of it was, was bore by your son. Father, I pray that at this moment, as we read these words, that we will be mindful of the seriousness of the moment. At the same time that we are mindful of God. May we be also reminded of, of the song that was sung literally right before I came up here. Because of this work, we as your creation and your children 
can literally raise a hallelujah to you. And we can praise you and we can adore you because of the sacrifice that you made on our behalf. You took our punishment. You took our shame. And you made a way. And we are so grateful that you did that work. Thank you for doing a redemptive work in our lives. Thank you that you didn't leave us abandoned in our place of sin, but you said, I will come to you. Thank you for doing that work, Lord God. You are so good to us. Thank you. We ask this in Jesus, the precious one, this sacrificial lamb who then becomes king. We ask in Jesus' name for you to have your favor. If you're taking notes at home today, your first point, today's sermon, as we're talking about these positions of Christ, is we see Christ outside the city. We see Christ outside the city. Uh, the passage, why we say that, is it found in verse 16 and 17, where we read these words. So, so he then handed him over, talking about Pilate, so Pilate then handed him over to them to be crucified. They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out, bearing his own cross to a place called, uh, to, to the place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. That phraseology, and he went out, and then it, and then it gives us even the, the, the location, this, this place of the skull, this place called Golgotha. It is letting us know that it is literally outside of the, the, of the city. It is outside of the temple area, if you will. It is outside of the daily activities of the people. Now, this is significant because, remember, Jesus, when he came, he came as the perfect lamb led to slaughter. Remember all the way back with John the Baptist when, when Jesus' ministry, earthly ministry, three years prior was inaugurated? John the Baptist sees Jesus walking and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is this scene. This is this scene of Jesus taking away the sin of the world. And it has to happen outside of the city, outside of the tabernacle, if you will. Now, now why do I say that? It's because we are told throughout Scripture about this. L listen with me to the words in Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 13, we start to see uh, this particular New Testament writer helping us to understand the significance of Jesus, this position of Jesus outside of the city. So in Hebrews chapter 13, we're starting in verse 11 and going through verse, verse 14, we read these words. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. So let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. So we're seeing here in, in the book of Hebrews chapter 13, we're seeing Jesus fulfill this Old Testament responsibility. So you're like, okay, if that's the case, let's go back to the Old Testament for a moment and actually read it from the book of Exodus to see why this was taking place. So when we get to Exodus chapter 29, verses 10 through 14, we read these words. It says, Then you shall bring the bull before the tent of meeting, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the bull. You shall slaughter the bull before the Lord at the doorway of the tent of meeting. This is that the shedding of the blood. You shall take some of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger. You shall pour out all the blood at the base of the altar. You shall take all the fat that covers the entrails and the lobe of the liver and the two kidneys and the fat that is on them and offer them up in smoke on the altar. But here it again. But the flesh of the bull and its hide and its refuge, you shall burn with, the fi with fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering. 
It is a sin offering. So what we are seeing here is we are seeing Jesus outside of the city, outside of the camp, outside of the holy place, becoming the sin offering, that which is burned up outside of the city. Because that is where the refuse, the sin, that which is stained, is taken and removed. So that there is now in the city a spot, a spotless one, a cleansed one. Now the distinction, the distinction between Exodus and Hebrews is that with, with Exodus, they had to do this every single year. Every year they had to bring in the atonement sacrifice for all the sins of the people. Anytime that the people sinned, they would have to bring sacrifices of sorts. There was constantly this repetitive action of of sacrifice for the sin, sacrifice for the sin. But when Jesus comes, when Jesus comes as the perfect Lamb of God, we don't see this repetitive nature any longer. We don't see Jesus continually having to be taken outside of the camp. Jesus died once and for all for the removal of all sin. And because of that work, because he went outside of the camp, because he shed his blood and died for your sins and for mine, because he did that work, he had to do it just one time, and it was sufficient. It was sufficient to cleanse you of all of your sin. It was sufficient to cleanse me from all of my sin. It was sufficient to be the life-saving atonement for all of humanity. All that people have to do is cry out unto him and say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. Save me. And because of that work outside of the camp, Jesus says, It'll be done. There is no other name by which one can be saved other than the name of Jesus. We say that so regularly in here. That, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and life, and no one comes to the Father but through him. This is absolutely vital truth for us to understand that his work has an eternal consequence to it. And as I've said, even in the opening remarks, if you die on this side of eternity without entering into that love relationship with him, then you spend eternity in the lake of fire separated from his mercy and grace forever and ever and ever in torment. But if on this side of eternity you cry out and say, Lord Jesus, save me, you enter into eternity in his presence forevermore, where there is no longer a sin barrier that affects the relationship that we have with him. We are now his forevermore in his presence. Gloriously restored. This is why we have to have this first position, this, this position of Christ outside of the city. It is probably the most important point in this entire process that we see here. Christ has to be taken outside the city. But, but there's a second place that we see. There's a second position that we find the Christ. The second position that we see within the Christ is that we see the Christ between two thieves. We see the Christ between two thieves found there in verse 18. It's as though they crucified him and with him two other men, one on either side and Jesus in between. Now, obviously in, in John's account, we don't know that these are thieves. In John's account, uh, we, we, we don't know uh, that the, the, the likelihood that they are, are probably even murderers, even probably. We don't know that from John's account. We just know he's he's crucified between two others here. That's all that it tells us. They crucified him with him with two other men, one on either side, and Jesus was in between. But he but we know from the other gospels this particular story of these two thieves. It, 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 at the beginning, when they first get brought up onto there, and then the the priest and the the leading officials start to mock and and taunt Jesus, what we know is that both of these thieves actually begin that process. Both of the thieves at the start of this day begin to hurl abuses at Jesus as well, start to mock him, and, and even like, hey, save us too. If you can save yourself, save us. And, and they're mocking Jesus. But at some point, at some point, one of the thieves stops, has a moment of apparent reflection, and realizes Jesus is actually an innocent man. That, that Jesus does not deserve to be on 
this cross. Now, he readily acknowledges, and he even says as he starts to rebuke the other thief, he even readily acknowledges, he says, we deserve to be up here. We, we did do wrong. We are sinners. But he, he does not deserve to be up here. Then that thief, this one, who recognizes there's something different about this one, because probably the way he's dying, because he's not dying like these two guys are. In the sense that he's dying with calm. He's dying without retaliation. He's dying without accusation. In fact, at a certain point on this cross, he's even going to say to them, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is the kind of death that Jesus is dying on this cross. And it has probably had an effect on this, this other thief. And so he then says to Jesus, remember me. When you enter into your kingdom. And Jesus responds. Today you will be with me in paradise. Why is this significant? Why is this position. Christ between two thieves. Such a significant position. And why do we need to, to point it out. And bring it out at this particular juncture in the story. And the reason is because. Jesus' blood is shed for everybody. There is nothing you have done. There is no sin, no wrong you have ever committed that the blood of Jesus Christ cannot cleanse. The Old Testament tells us that without the shedding of blood, there's no covering, no remission, no, no forgiveness of sin. But with the shedding of blood, all sin is forgiven. And Jesus being that perfect sacrifice, literally God in flesh, bleeding there, dying. His blood is the cleansing factor. And so it doesn't matter what you've done. You could literally be like these guys and probably be murderers. You could be like these guys, and we know that they are thieves. You could be like these guys on the cross. And all you have to do is cry out, Lord Jesus, save me, a sinner. And he will say to you, just like he says to that thief on the cross, he will say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And this is why I believe we see this particular position. We also see the urgency of the moment in this picture of this position of Christ between these two thieves. The reason why we see this as being significant is because of the fact that these guys are literally dying. So literally at any point, in other words, it is never too late. As long as you are drawing breath, as long as today is today, you can cry out and say, Lord Jesus, save me. You can't say, oh, I've done too much. It's too far. There's, it's, it's too late for me. It's never too late for you. As long as you have breath, cry out to Jesus and say, save me, a sinner. And he will. Now, I'd also warn you, you do not know when you will die. Obviously, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people around this world who just a month or so back did not know that they were going to get this COVID-19 and have their life ended because of this, this disease, this pandemic that has spread our world. They did not know it. That's part of the reason why the scriptures tell us we need to be ready. Because we don't know what's going to come. Obviously, there's a, there's a handful. Our musicians are here. Our sound techs are up there. They do not know what their trip home might bring for them today. No one knows our eternal condition. We don't know when we will pass from this side of eternity which is the reason why we should not, when we hear the truth, when we hear the message of hope, we shouldn't say, oh, I'll get to it one day. Oh, one day I'll make that decision. Because every time you make that decision, you've already made a decision, and the decision you made was rejection of Jesus Christ, the Savior and Lord. You are not promised this moment between Christ like this thief was. Make the decision today. The scripture says it this way. Today is the day of salvation. 
Make that decision today. Because Jesus died for everybody. As long as there is breath, you can make that decision. So we see Christ, the position of Christ outside of the, the city. We see the position of Christ between two thieves. But we also see the position of Christ beneath the inscription. Beneath the inscription. Look with me at verses 19 through 22. 19 through 22, we read these words. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews were, were saying to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Now, the reason why I like this particular scene is because. And why this is significant that we need to point out that Christ beneath the inscription is because this kind of even goes back to what we talked about last week. There is a truth. There is a truth. And the truth isn't that he said that he was the king of the Jews. The truth is that he is the king of the Jews. For that matter, he is the king of the entire world. And you have Pilate here being antagonistic. Pilate doesn't really care if Christ Jesus is indeed the king of the Jews. He is literally doing this literally as a way of, of, of snubbing these religious leaders. He knows that this sign is going to be offensive to them because they don't recognize the kingship of Jesus. If they had recognized the kingship of Jesus, they would not have created their kangaroo court. If they had truly known that Jesus was indeed the savior of the world, they would not have had him sent off to Pilate to be, again, falsely accused, to be falsely tried, and to then put political pressure on Pilate to have Christ Jesus scourged with, a, with and then the crown of thorns placed on his head, and then him literally ultimately being taken to the cross to, to have the nails driven into his hands, into his feet, and for him to literally hang there. That was never have been their plan if they really understood him to truly be the, the king. But that's what happened. But in this plaque over him, it does declare the truthfulness of this. And this, again, this goes right back to last week's comments where we see that, that Pilate and Jesus, they're talking, and Jesus says, look, he says, I've come that, to, to point basically to the truth. And Pilate then says, what is truth? Truth is Christ Jesus. It is a person. Even today, even this morning, in my own personal quiet times, I, I was reading out of John chapter 17. And in John 17, it's, it's literally Jesus' prayer. It's Jesus' prayer to the Father for his disciples that were there with him at that time. But it was also prayer for, for you and me, for the disciples that would come after the apostles. And, and in there, at a certain point in the prayer, Jesus even says, and, and God, your word is truth. It is so important for us to understand that there is a standard. And it doesn't make a difference if the world agrees with the standard. It doesn't make a difference even, quite frankly, if you agree with the standard. The truth is still the truth. And when Pilate puts that sign up, even though he's not doing it from a position of recognition of the truth, he is fulfilling, if you will, the scriptures themselves and saying, here is the truth. And it was an affront to the religious leaders. And unfortunately, it is an affront to many in this world, which is again a scripture that we so often quote here, which is the reason why broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many there are that find it, but narrow is the road that leads to life, and few there are that find it. And what you need to understand, and I said this even last week, that narrow road, it is wide enough for everyone. You just got to choose Christ. Let Jesus truly be your Savior, be your Lord. So we see this Christ beneath the inscription as the declaration of the truth of who he is. So we see Christ outside the city. We see Christ between two thieves. We see Christ beneath the scripture, the inscription. And we then see Christ above the soldiers. We see Christ above the soldiers. Look with me at verses 23 through the very first part of verse 25. 
23 for the first part of verse 25. It says, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts. A part to every soldier and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments among them. For my clothing, they cast lots. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. Obviously, we've said, again, I've said this so many times this morning service. We have said this so many times. <laughs> Jesus had to fulfill literally every single scripture that was about him. There's over 300 prophetic words about Jesus being the Messiah. If one of those, if just one of those does not happen, then Jesus is not the Messiah. Down to the very crucifixion, to the very soldiers who are beneath him, who are literally casting lots for his clothing. And yet for his tunic, recognizing, oh, this is a seamless piece. Let's not tear, tear that. Let's cast the lots for it. Because everything else we've torn and passed out. But for this tunic, let us cast lots and give that to the one who wins the lot. The fulfillment of Scripture. Christ has to kill them all. But I think there's another side of this when, when, I, when I look at this. When, when I think about it in a positional perspective. At this moment in, 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 in human history, at that single singular second, Christ humbled himself. In other words, Christ is still, even here at this moment on the cross, he is still king of kings and lord of lords. He is still God in flesh incarnate. Even the religious leaders who were crying out, you saved others and save yourself, come down off the cross. Could Christ have done that? The answer is a resounding yes, he could have. He is God. And these soldiers think that they have authority over him to such an extent that, that earlier that he was literally beaten by a Roman centurion. Earlier, he was actually punched and, and, and made fun of and saying, prophesy, prophesy by these Roman soldiers. They literally put a crown of thorns on his head. They who thought they had authority over Christ were usurping and, or, or, or exercising, not usurping, but exercising their authority over the Christ, thinking they were the ones in charge. But at any moment, Jesus could have said, I have had enough. <laughs> Speak a word and they are no more. And so what you see here is you see the truest picture of Jesus' preaching of the Sermon at the Mount with the Beatitudes. You see the example of literal meekness here on the cross of Christ. Meekness is literally, it is power under control. That is what meekness is. Christ Jesus had all of the authority of all of creation. He could have called out for his angelic multitudes to come in and literally destroy them all. We know from the Old Testament that one angel destroyed like 200,000 uh, soldiers from another nation. The, the might and power of the spiritual army at Jesus' disposal was beyond any comprehension of anyone on this particular scene. Even Elisha, when he's there um, with his servant, and the, 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 the Samaritan armies come around him, and he's like, he's like the, the servant's like, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? And Elisha says to him, don't worry. Greater are they that are with us than they that are down there. And he then prays to God and says, open up my servant's eyes. And he opens up and he sees these chariots of fire and this mass army surrounding the Samaritans. This is the authority of God. And yet, and yet, the Christ, even though he is positionally at this moment above them, he has humbled himself beneath their authority and allowed them for this season to fulfill the scriptures to prove that he is 
so often. I think that that's an example for us, even right now, even right now. My own personal convictions are, can let the church, if you want to come, let the church come. But because of the authority of the, the state, the governor, and of our federal, and their request that we do not convene like this, we have submitted ourselves to their authority. And yet at the same time, we are doing this and proclaiming the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord. This is part of the way that we as Christ followers exhibit and display the meekness of Christ. It is a powerful moment. It is a powerful scene to see the authority in that perspective. There's one last, there's one last thing that we see here. And that is the position of Christ on the cross. The position of Christ on the cross. And there's two aspects of the position of Christ on the cross that we see. The first aspect of Christ on the cross that we see is the expression of earthly love. Is the expression of earthly love. This is found in the second part of verse 25, going through verse 27. The second part of verse 25, 1 through 27, reads this way, But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own household. Remember, Jesus is the firstborn son. It, it was his responsibility to take care of his mother. And so in a loving fashion, a loving earthly expression of his love, he looks down and he sees his only disciple who has actually come to the cross to watch him die, John, there beside his mother. And his heart is broken because remember, he is fully God and he is fully man. And in this moment, he is dying. And in this moment, there is literal physical pain that he's experiencing. In this moment, there is emotional heartbreak. In this moment, there is a burden recognizing he's about to leave them at this moment. Yes, he is fully God and he knows that in three days he's going to rise again. He knows that he is going to dwell with him for 40 days, and then he's going to ascend into heaven, and then and then 10 days later that the Holy Spirit's going to come. He knows that he's coming back. He knows who he is. But at the same time, he is fully man, and he is looking on this one who he is, who, who gave her entire life, if you will, for him. Who, when she wasn't even married yet, but just betrothed, literally said to the angel, be unto me, as you have said. And she then becomes the handmaid of God, if you will. The one who would bear the Christ, Jesus, the Savior of the world. And she has loved him. The scripture says that she has treasured these things in her heart. Even the prophetic words of Simeon said that she would be basically cut because of her son, knowing that he was going to die like this. Her heart is breaking. He is breaking. His heart is breaking. And so his last act as the, as the firstborn son is to make certain that his mother is taken care of. And yes, he has other siblings, but they're not there. There's no indication that they're there. The only indication is that John is there. So he looks at his mother and he says, Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. And from that day on, she lived in John's house. What a beautiful expression of earthly love. And this, it's, it's in that expression that it helps us understand how much Jesus loves us. If he spent, if he, if on, the, on his death, if you will, he took the moment to point out to the world his love for her. Does he love you and me? It is an infinite love. And he
he made just as much of a sacrifice for you and for me as he did for his mom. What an amazing picture. But then we not only see the expression of the earthly love, but we see the expression of the eternal love. We see the expression of the eternal love found there in verses 28 through 30. And after this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, again, everything has to fulfill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. No one took Jesus' life. Jesus gave up his spirit. He is the one who stated the, the economical term to telestai. Here in that phrase, it is finished. It is Jesus who says the account is cleared. The debt payment is now paid. You owe nothing. The wages of your sin, which were death, have now been taken in me. I have borne your sin, your shame, your disgust, and your punishment. I have borne it for you. It is paid. It is finished. It is to tell us that. And then he gives his life up. That is an eternal expression that ought to grip us to the core of who we are. It ought to drive us literally to our knees and just say, thank you, God, for your amazing love, for your amazing sacrifice, for your amazing mercy. Thank you that you've given it all that I might know you. Maybe you're here watching this. You've heard these words and you've never actually cried out and said, Lord Jesus, save me a sinner. The scripture, as I've already indicated earlier today, says today is the day of salvation. Today is the day in which you can enter into a love relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. All you have to do is say, Jesus, save me a sinner. Forgive me. And then turn. Turn from your wicked way and say, Jesus, fill me full of your Holy Spirit. Let me walk in this life filled with you. He promises that he will. If you've done that, if you'd be so gracious in, in the feed, in, in the YouTube feed or in the Facebook feed, let us know that we can come alongside of you and encourage you and, and, and get some discipleship materials even into your hands and to help you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Because, because one of the things that we know is that when we cry out and we receive Jesus, he says that we are new creations, that the old is, is, is gone and the new has come. But we're literally babies in Jesus, and we need to learn how to grow in our relationship with him. We'd like to come alongside of you and help you understand how you can grow in that relationship with Lord Jesus. So if you've made that decision today, if you put that in the, in the comment section on the feed that you're watching, and let us know of your decision that you've made today. Maybe you're already Christ. Maybe you know that you know that you are his. But for whatever reason, maybe today you're coming to the realization, you know what? I've been, I've been living pridefully in my own life. I, I, I haven't been humbling myself before Christ. I, I haven't been living in the fullness of the joy of my salvation. I haven't been living with that perfect peace that surpasses all understanding. I, I've been living and trying to do this in my own strength and my own might. Today is a day, especially as we are starting next Sunday, pointing to Easter. Today is a day where you can humble yourself before the Father and, and just say, God, I am sorry. And in 1 John 1, 9, he tells us that if we will confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He, he will restore the relationship. The eternity was never lost, but the relationship has been hindered and broken. He says, I, I will step in. I will restore that relationship. Will you turn yourself toward him? Humble yourself meekly, just as he did even under the authority of these Roman soldiers. Will you humble yourself and follow Christ's example? And let the relationship be restored and let that joy of your salvation fill you full once again.
may you respond to him this day. Let's close in prayer. And as our musicians come, they will lead us in one last song. And during that song, make that time of decision, a time of reconciliation with the Father. Lord, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this moment of time. Thank you for allowing us to be able to come together in this format, in this venue, to worship you, to love you, to know that you are indeed God, to know what you did for us on the cross of Calvary. May our hearts be strengthened as a result of this day. May we enter into the position of being in fellowship with you, right there with you, loving you and adoring you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your work on the cross and for the eternal light you've given to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.